If you have a Bible or a Bible app, uh, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1 today. And um, I'm excited coming up this weekend is Easter weekend. And we're going to celebrate the entire weekend, as you've heard from the announcements from John. We're going to uh, celebrate with Friday night, and then the videos will be available on Saturday. The worship will be available on Saturday evening all the way through Sunday, and then uh, sunrise service. But I'm very excited to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is a question I'm going to ask next Sunday, which is somewhat provocative, maybe, is how do you believe in a dead God? And so... I hope you uh, uh, watch that next week as we celebrate together. Uh, As we continue this series, my prayer continues to be for us all that God's followers would have joy. And not only that God would bring us joy, but that it would be sustained through all of this. Because I believe this, there are a lot of people that don't have joy, and it is the people of God that have the good news of Jesus Christ and the joy of him in their heart and they can share that. And so my prayer is constantly that God would keep the joy within our hearts and that we would, uh, we would see the greatness of God. And it's not just any joy, of course. What I've talked about, and John Piper kind of helped with this, this uh, definition, but what I'm talking about with joy is joy is the feeling or the emotion from the awareness of good things from God. It's basically this, is that we have joy, and it's the emotion of the awareness of the grace of God. We see God work even in bad circumstances and in good circumstances, but we see him work. Uh, it means, like Stephen Furtick says, the joy is not always a lever to be pulled to change circumstances. Joy is not always a lever to pull and just see the circumstances change. It is joy is a lens to change the way we see God in our circumstances. Joy is not always a lever to be pulled that changes our circumstances, but it's a lens in which we see uh, God within our circumstances and how he works. He changes our views. Uh, My view has been changed on several things through these days. One in particular, one view in particular, is how I view birthday cakes. You put a candle on there, and I've, I've been... You know, I'm a clean person and I've, I, I sanitize, but I've seen much more now as we are acclimating ourselves to being very sanitized that uh, I probably won't eat another birthday cake when somebody blows out the candle again. It's just, it's just, it's just nasty. And so that my view has changed. There are a lot of things in God changes our views, but one of those good things that God gives us the joy that he shows us, one of those good things is people. I know that we don't see everybody that way, but there are certain people that is in my life, that has been in my life and has been in your life that has brought joy to your life and has strengthened your faith and has given you uh, a better life. Andy Stanley Uh, at North Point did a survey a few years ago to determine the top five things that affect people's lives the most. And one of those are providential relationships. Providential or divine relationships. People that God has brought into your life to help you. And Philippians talks about that and we'll get to that this morning. But I want to ask these questions from you, and I want this to this to apply to your life as you're sitting in your living room and you've got your new church clothes on, your pajamas, or whatever it is that you have. As you're sitting there, I want you to say this out loud. I want you to say a name out loud to yourself or even the people around you. Here is a question: Who in your life has God used to strengthen your faith and your life? Who is someone in your life that God has used to strengthen? your faith. Basically, do you believe that God has put someone in your life to help you? Number two, here's a question. Do you believe that you could be that kind of person to someone else? Who is it that someone in your life that has been something special to you, a divine thing that God has put together? And do you believe that you could be that kind of person to someone else? Third question, 
what would it do to your life put to be that kind of person to someone else? What would it do to your life if you were the kind of person that helped others move forward, that, that gave other people strength and faith? Because here's what I believe, and you may be, you may be watching and you, don't, you, you have questions or you don't, have, you don't believe in what I'm talking about and you don't have faith in Jesus Christ. I, I, I would just invite you to consider what I'm talking about this morning and just, uh, just open your heart to the, the possibility that God actually puts people in your life. You could even say this, what, who are people in my life that have actually made my life better? And could it possibly be that God has done that? When we say this, God brought people into my life. God brought me into someone else's life. And so therefore what happens from that, that brings joy is we begin to treat people different. We begin to view our wives different. We begin to view our husbands different. We begin to view our children different. We begin to view the people that were sitting in the living room next to us. Or if you're alone and you have nobody that's, that's with you, but yet you've got a, a group of people that are friends that are watching out for you or that you are talking to and you can help them. God brought y'all together. And what that does is brings joy to life. To get a better picture of this, we want to look in Philippians but to get a bit better picture, I want to, uh, I want to show you how Paul uh, was brought into the lives of this church at Philippi and how Philippi, the, those people's lives were brought into Paul's and how it changed his world. Uh, Paul one day, one night had a vision. He had a dream that someone from Macedonia was waiting on him. So he felt like God wanted him to go to Macedonia. And this is in Acts chapter 16. And so when Paul was on his journey and on his way to Macedonia, he stopped by Philippi. He, as he usually did, he went and preached in the synagogues. And, and then he walked around and he saw a women's Bible study. A lady that was leading the study, her name was Lydia, a seller of purple. And they were talking about the law and going into scripture, but yet they didn't quite understand what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They didn't understand uh, who Jesus was and what it all meant. So Paul began to explain to these ladies. And so the church actually began from a women's Bible study. Fantastic. So in this, uh, in this Bible study, uh, he made great friends and God brought him into the life of Lydia and her friends. And Lydia's house be got, was saved and he baptized them. Then, there, then he walked along and there was a woman who was, um, who was demon-possessed. And there were some other men who were exploiting that. And they, uh, they were making money off of this lady. Paul got tired of it. So, and the Bible says he got tired of it. And so he went to uh, this lady and he cast the demon out. And when they cast the demon out, she was no longer crazy. And so the men couldn't make money off of her. So they got mad and had him put into jail. They lied about him and had him and Silas put into jail. Well, at the jail, Paul and Silas began to pray and sing and an earthquake took place and the doors of the prison flung open. And, uh, and as that was taking place, the jailer who was watching that night, he got scared that he was going to be killed. So he just said, I'll just kill myself since everyone's escaped. And as he was fixing to kill himself, Paul hollers out, God brought Paul into this man's life and said, don't do it. Don't just stop. We're not leaving. No one's left the jail. But let me tell you something about what we believe, about what has changed our lives. And so he began to talk about Jesus and the gospel and the good news of how Jesus could forgive him and how God can change him. And so the, the, that jailer, he trusted Christ. And so that night he took Paul and Silas to his home and the rest of the family trusted Christ. And they washed their wounds after the, that Paul and Silas had been beaten the night before, washed their wounds and gave them food and then took them back to the jail. And the next morning the, they were let out of the jail, but were told you need to leave the city. And so after uh, some conversations, Paul and Silas left the city, and that's how the church started. It started from God putting Paul into the lives of these people. And then a little later, again, as I said last week, Paul was put into prison. And in prison, 
uh, he, in, in Rome. He was put into prison in Rome later. And this church heard about it, sent Epaphrodites over to encourage Paul and to give him some money. And so these people were put into Paul's life to encourage him and to strengthen him. I don't know if there's anybody like that in your life. And I don't know that maybe there's somebody in your life that's like that that you don't, are not recognizing and you're not seeing it. And there's conflict within your home, there's conflict within your, your life, and there's conflict in relationships in your life that God has brought someone into your life and you don't see it yet. Maybe you have the ability to be in someone else's life and to change their life and God brought you for them, but you don't see that yet. You don't see the glory and the grace of being in other people's lives and for them being in yours. But if we could see that, there's some things that could change. And here are some things that Paul says in Philippians that could change in your life. And I wanna, I wanna separate it in two things. Number one, I want to give you a view or two views, how we view uh, the joy that comes from our divine relationships or how we view divine relationships. And then number two are things that we do within those divine relationships to help other people and strengthen their faith, to bring joy into their lives and for them to bring joy into ours. Number one, that we see these two views. The first view that we see is number one, be thankful. Simple enough. Look in here in verse 3. Paul sends a letter back to talk to these Philippians, and he says, here's what I want to tell you. I want to send this letter back to let you know how I feel about you and about our relationship, that God brought us together. Here's how I feel about it. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. It means every time I think of you, I'm grateful. Every time I think of the memories that we've had, I'm grateful. And they haven't been all fond memories. I, as a matter of fact, I, the, the lady that was in the church that God had healed from, from demon possession, it got Paul put into prison, but he's thankful that God had put those relationships. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Listen, very simply, and I don't want to spend very much time on this because I think that we all know this, that if we were grateful for the people that are around us, it would change the way that we treat them and it would change the way that they view us. Be thankful for the people that are around you. Be thankful. My father has told me several times, when I've been stressed and things around my world have, have been different, he said several times that just remember that when you go home to the people that are at your home, your kids and your wife, they don't care what's happening in the world. All they care is daddy's home. Thank God for the people that are around you. Thank God for the person that's sitting next to you. And even thank God if you're alone in your home and you, you, you have lost some people that are precious to you and, and maybe you're alone in your home, thank God for the people that, have, that God has substituted to be able to, to step in to help you and to be a part of your life. See, what will happen is if you are thankful for people, then you will realize the benefit they have in your life and you will realize that you can be a benefit into their life. Your speech will change. Everything will change. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. We'll step into that in just a few moments. But the second thing I want to notice in our view, and this is very important, is uh, that not only are we thankful but we also have confidence in the work of Christ in those people. We are confident in the work of Christ in those people. Let me explain in just a moment. Let's read it. Verse 6, it says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is a strong statement. He says, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. See, Paul saying this, that I am confident. Now, the word confident means fully aware and fully confident that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this will take place, that the work that Jesus started in you, he will complete it. It means this is that Paul noticed and recognized the work of Christ in other people and he was confident that Jesus would do his work in their lives. Listen, God, what it does is Paul was able to see the value that Christ puts on people. You see, not only are we thankful for people, but we also see the value that Christ puts on people. 
You see, Jesus sees people and he works in their lives and and it's so valuable that he is going to do the work. Now, I want you to understand this, that the verse does not indicate of your, your confidence in people. The verse does not indicate that you bring, you get joy because you're confident in people because people can let you down. They can. And you can be disappointed in people, but that doesn't change the fact that God is doing a work and God wants to do a work and you can be a part of that. And so what he's saying, Paul is not indicating that our confidence is in people. He is indicating that our confidence is in Christ. Jesus Christ is who we serve and Jesus Christ is who we, uh, who we love. And even if you're not following Christ, I want you to understand this, that, that, that Christ wants to be a part of your life so that he can do a work and a genuine work that makes a difference in the world. He sees the value that Christ puts on people. See, what's happening is Paul has confidence in the work of Christ and full confidence. And when he says this, he says that I not only see the work of Christ being done, but he says I see it in completion. It's the same word that means it is finished. It is the word, it's the the idea that is indicated by the same that Jesus says on the cross. It's complete. No more work has to be done. Imagine this. Could you imagine someone saying this? about you. Uh, Don't touch it. It's perfect. Could you imagine that being said about you that you no, you're perfect. Don't touch it. It means complete. It means that the work that Jesus is doing in my life, he is still working on me, but the work that Jesus is doing in my life, he will complete it. And the work he's doing in your life, he will complete it. And so what it is, is that it's our confidence in knowing this, that God, number one, God initiates this work. You see, when Paul was talking to these the Philippians, he's talking to these people, he understood that God, the God in him could save those people, that Jesus could save them. And so therefore, Paul went and ministered to them. And then God takes responsibility for the work. God takes full responsibility for the works that's, work that's done and it's full confidence. Now, here's where it comes in for us. This is what we do with it. This is where it comes in for us, is that I am thankful and I am confident that Jesus can do such a work in your life that I am willing to get involved in it. Look at this here. It says in verse number seven, He says, I believe this, and it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul is saying this. He said, I believe in the work of God so much that I want to be a part of that work. This is where we find joy in our divine relationships. Not only that we understand that people are part of our lives, but it's this, is that we understand that God is working in each each one of those lives that we want to be a part of that work. We want to help people be better. We want to help people be better. So here are the two things that Paul says that we are to do. If we view that Jesus values people and we are thankful, we value people, then here's what we do with that. Number one is we pray for people. If you think God can do a work in their heart, start praying for them. Even if they're, even if they're rotten or if they're wonderful Christians, pray for people. I think we have lost this in, to, to some degree, but it is very important that we understand the value and the power of prayer. Listen to this in verse number nine. It says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless before for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We pray for them, why? Because it, number one, it's a work of Christ. And so we know that we can't change people, we can't make people better, we, but we can be part of the work of God to make people better. Therefore, pray for them that God works in their life. Pray for their success. Now, here's what we pray for. Number one, you pray for uh, their love in Jesus to grow. Pray that they grow in their walk with Christ. 
If they don't know Christ, you pray that they know Christ. If you are, are not a follower of Christ, I would hope that someone's praying for you. I would, I, I would hope, and I, and I want you to know that I'm praying, and I may not know you, but I'm praying that if you do not know Christ, that you find him. I want to pray that your life becomes better. That's what I'm praying for, and I believe Jesus makes life better. So I believe that if we can fall in love with Jesus, I tell my girls this all the time, and I'm sure that you, you uh, would do this too, is I, I, don't, I pray a lot of things for them, but one thing that I tell them that I pray for the most is I want them to fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with Jesus, life begins to fall into place as he wants it. Number two, uh, as what do we pray for? You pray for them to love Jesus and to grow. Number, t- uh, number two is you pray that they would be wise to stand before God blameless. In verse number 10, it says, so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless. It, basically, the understanding of that is that you would make the right choices, that you would have, a wi- have wise action, that you would approve what is excellent, that you would say, yes, that's the best move. Basically, that God would give you wisdom in your life. Pray for people in their love for God. Pray for them that their love would grow, that their life would grow, that they would become better. Number two is pray that their actions would become better. Listen, I know that we all don't make best decisions in the world, but instead of criticizing each other, maybe we could pray that we make better decisions. Maybe we could pray for ourselves, that we would have grace on ourselves and say we would make better decisions, and we would pray for others and say, God, help them make good decisions. Be wise. Then the number three part of it, he says that you would make a difference in the world. It says, so be blameless for the day of Christ. When you stand before God, you're blameless. And it says, filled with the fruit of righteousness, that you would make a difference in the world. Pray that people around you would make a difference in the world. And here's where, when you pray, you begin to want to be involved in it. You say, I want to be involved in it. So if I'm going to pray for you, I also want to help you be that. And if someone would pray for us, we, we want people to help us and, and to, to be better ourselves because we can't do it within ourselves. This is definitely not a holier than thou and I know better than you and I'm, no, what it is is I genuinely love you so I want to sacrifice my life and I want to be obedient to Christ to help you be the person God made you to be. I'm not on, I'm not on this world for me. I'm on this world because God wants to use me for other people. It says this, basically this, you pray for the success of other people. Your prayer should be for the success of other people that they would be successful in their relationship with Christ and that they would be successful in making a difference in the world. So number four, the the, the second part, this is the second part of, uh, of what we do. Number one is what we view, how we view people. We are thankful and we have confidence. Now, number two is what we do with that. What do we do with our gratitude and our confidence in the Lord and how God views people? What do we do with that? Number one is pray for people. Number two is become partners with people. Verse number five, he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, we're all in this together. I, don't, I, I know that we feel like we might be in, this, in a different boat. We're all alone and you might feel all alone, but we're all in this together. What, what's happening now, we're in it together. What's happening in the world, even, even what's happening in your home. If you are married and you have a family, what's happening in your home is happening to everyone. Not just you. We're all in this together. So if we are thankful for the people God has put into our lives then we not only help others and they not only help us, but it becomes a circle. And here's what happened is Paul witnessed to Lydia and then witnessed to the the woman and she got saved that was demon possessed and then witnessed to the jailer and they all formed a church. And then when Paul was in prison, they helped him. And then Paul in turn sent a letter to them. It's a cycle of you helping each other and partnering together, not only for each other, but you're also partnering together for the help of other people. 
He says, we are in the partnership of this. And then in verse 12, there's verse 12, it says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me is really to serve as the advance of the gospel. Things begin to move forward. We are partners. Paul saw the work of Christ and he just wanted to join in. And he says, I want to partner in this. I, I want to be a part of making you better. Paul wanted to be a part of the work of Christ in planting the church. And in turn, the church wanted to be a part of the work of Christ in, with Paul in prison. And it just kept going. So the benefit from this experience is that you get to have a partner and not a villain. The benefit of this experience is you suffer together and you work together. You get to make a difference in the world together. Instead of des destroying a rela relationship, you get to not only help your relationship, but it allows you to impact others for God. So how do we view each other? Be thankful and be confident that God is doing a work in other people, that God values other people. And what do we do with that? Pray for other people and partner with them. I don't know if you uh, know how ice cream cones got started. Now, there is a patent that was said to have started a few years earlier, but in the early 1900s, there was a man who, uh, who was passing out ice cream, and he had a deal going, and so everyone was coming up to get ice cream, and uh, he ran out of bowls. So his neighbor over here was handing out and baking pastries, and so this guy that was baking pastries, he had this idea that he would make something and he would wrap it up like a cone. And so he shared that idea with the guy who was making ice cream and it became a bowl, an edible bowl. And so they two came together, helped each other to make ice cream cones for ice cream and thank God for it. Change the world. Ice cream. Well, here's the thing is God's working in the world. And he wants us to be a part of that work. God's working in your wife. God's working in your husband. God's working in your children. God's working in your neighbors. And God's working in, 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 with Belmont. Even though we can't meet, God's working with the people in our small groups. God's working. And what he's asking you to do is, are you in or are you out? You want to be a blessing? See your relationships. Be thankful for those people. See that God's working in them. Pray for them. Pray for people. And then just partner in the work of Christ. Invitation or the response that you might have is number one is you may not have uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may, uh, you may not believe that God puts things together and puts people in your life, but you, uh, God is speaking to you right now and just giving you an interest, something that is pulling you and saying, Will you believe this? Will you trust this? And I would ask that you wrestle with this and say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and I want to partner with him. I want for him to be my Lord and I want him to change my life. And you can do that. You can ask God to forgive you of your sins and admit that you're a sinner and then trust him to be your savior. And if you do that, I, I, I want you to email me at pastor at mybelmont.org and we can talk further. But for you who are believers, who are followers of Christ, this is how your joy, this is the one thing that God can give to you and your awareness of good things. One of the good things God's given to you are people in your life. And we can make it, we can make it a miserable time or there can be joy in our lives through people. The people that are around you, specifically around you and how you view them. So the response is number one, just are you thankful? If you're not, maybe you need to pray and say, God, give me a heart of gratitude. Pray for these people. And then say, you know what? I wanna to work together. Maybe you work together raising your kids. Maybe you work together in your marriage. Maybe you work together uh, in your business. I don't know what it may be that you're working together with, but we're working together, partners. 
and whatever God has. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the great privilege to be here. And I want to personally, in the open, thank you for uh, my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you for the opportunity to be with them a little extra. And even in the frustration of, of, of the changes that we've made, Lord, I thank you that you've allowed me to be with them. Lord, I thank you for the people that have been in my life that uh, maybe have passed away already. And, but Lord, thank you that they've been part of my life that have helped me to grow. Thank you for Belmont and the staff and the deacons and the Sunday school teachers and the ministers and, and then everyone that is just part of Belmont. Thank you. I pray that you'd help them and give them all grace and continue their joy. Thank you for these people that are recording this today and, and sacrificing and taking their time to do that today. Lord, I thank you for you. And if it weren't for you and your love for me and your cross, I would have never known the joy, the joy of being a follower of yours. Change my heart, continue to change my heart to see the good in people. Change my heart to see how you value people and help me to help them. And let me recognize the things that they helped me. God, we could continue on and on and on, but one thing's for sure. Thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen.